Dzień dobry, witam Państwa wszystkich serdecznie w strefie designu Uniwersytetu SWPS. Ja nazywam się Agata Bisping, a naszym dzisiejszym gościem jest Laura Traldi, dziennikarka, blogerka, była redaktorka magazynu La Republika. Obecnie redaktor prowadząca Interview Design Journal, to jest online nowa wersja kultowego magazynu Interview. Laura pracuje w branży projektowej od 1997 roku. Pracowała jako kierownik do spraw komunikacji globalnej Philips Design w Eindhoven, a od 2004 roku jest dziennikarką dla profesjonalnych i zasięgowych tytułów. W 2011 roku założyła swój własny blog designatlarge.it. Tam możecie przeczytać o tym, z kim spotyka się i jakie zakresy w kontekście designu Laura pisuje. Dzisiaj nasze spotkanie prowadzimy w języku angielskim. Laura jest w Mediolanie, dlatego czasem muszę się pociąg przejeżdża, ponieważ jej mieszkanie znajduje się tuż przy stacji przy Portugu. A dzisiaj opowiemy, zastanowimy się o tym, w jaki sposób wygląda projektowanie i świat związany z projektowaniem praktycznie po pandemii. Ok, so I will just start our meeting in English. Hello, Laura. Thank you for agreeing. Hello, Agatha. Thank you for today. The presentation was wonderful. It was great. Great. <laughs> I'm also, sure. Yeah, I also tried to explain, but I wasn't sure if the noise that I heard was the train or something else. But I just, you know, uh, sort of uh, introduced our audience with the fact that you are in Milan uh, yeah. in a place that is near the central station, so sometimes you can hear the trains coming back. Actually, I'm in the new area called Nolo, which is very trendy, and this is where the alcove and everything for the Fori Salone was set last year, when there was a Fori Salone, of course. Okay, so we'll obviously yeah. have only trendy trains coming. Uh, coming obviously. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, today, uh, today we meet uh, to talk about what's in store for the design industry. And um, the, question, um, the questions I'd like to ask you, uh, they concern the, the state of design as it is halfway through pandemic, because we cannot obviously say that we, we are done and the pandemic, pandemic is over and that, that we all can go back to the world that was before it. And certainly the world that is ahead of us is totally different than what we've met. All, although sometimes when you see how people behave, I sometimes wonder whether you know anyone can learn any lesson <laughs> from what we are going through. And um, uh, do designers and design critics have more work nowadays? Uh, and has the branch, the design branch, design industry, been struck by the crisis profoundly? Has it changed anyway, um, based on your opinion and observations? Well. I think it has. I mean, it's a very uh, complex question. Let's start with the designers and yeah. then we link to the industry because it's very related. I think that there are different types of designers. I think, of course, as everybody knows, there are industrial designers who live because of their royalties. And there are designers who obviously um, are more like, uh, let's say, maybe produce smaller pieces that they sell in galleries. Uh, designers who work as art directors for companies, designers who um, for example, work uh, by providing companies with consultancy related to art direction or other, other issues. Um, I think the biggest hit, the designers that are hit the most in this uh, situation have been the ones who live on royalties. So the designers who rely on a massive amount of products being sold to get the percentage out of those products, I think those will be hit really hard. And I used to think, uh, well, there aren't that many, you know, most designers. I've always been investigating this uh, this link between money and designers uh, because I've always been convinced that a lot of designers don't earn a lot, which is true. So I was thinking to myself during the pandemic, probably they would not suffer that much because I, I don't know hardly anybody who lives on royalties. Um, so we did this little investigating, well, investigation, we did, we did this story on Intelligent Design Journal actually about this. So we asked um, designers who actually do live on royalties and there are, and there are quite many. Um, especially people who are about 50. Um, so we talked to Alberto Meda, who is one of the most uh, prolific Italian designers. Uh, he's not very famous and he's very shy and he's an engineer as well. So he's like a kind of, but he has designed most 
of the lamps that you see around, like some historical lamps, some common lamps that we made today. And for him, this is like a massive hit, you know, because he knows that for two months nothing was produced, which means that two two months of production will not be sold in the stores. The stores, maybe now they've they've opened, but you know, which um, which stores in America are open at the moment? Hardly any. Do Americans go out to buy lamps? No. So the American uh, market is really important for us. All these things. He, he told me he was going to have a massive hit and it was not going to be now immediately. It's going to be in six months or eight months. And he is obviously one who's made a career, but there are many younger designers who live. Um, of course, it's quite rare for a young designer to live on royalties. Um, so I, talked, I spoke to Luca Nichetto, who is a, a, like a very well-established designer who works maybe 40% on royalties and 60% on other things. And he says he he's getting out of it okay because of the 60 percent so he, he still does other things uh you know if you're a teacher if you uh, do consultancy for companies and i know most designers do but this, the royalty systems it's, it's system is obviously based on sales so now we move on to the industry yeah. and i think again um there was a there was a, um, a congress yesterday in milan by pam bianco which is a very famous um, magazine um, about design and, and let's say it's not about design it's a, it's an economic magazine about luxury so it talks about fashion design and this sort of industries and yesterday there was the, the design congress and basically a lot of companies were saying that surprisingly they're doing much much better than they expected uh, some of them have even made more than they did last year in the same month uh, and of course, there's been like a stop, so they lost money for two months. But now it seems for them that everything's gone back to normal. Although that's not the same, that's not true for everybody. So it really depends on which sort of industry you are. So, for example, it depends on how do you uh, how do you create your products? Do you make them by using local suppliers in Italy, or do you make them using suppliers from China or from Hungary or from abroad? Because everything that's from abroad is difficult now yeah because um you know for example i know a company uh, abed laminati they they, they work yeah. uh they, they they were waiting for a printer for a massive digital printer to be delivered from spain they just needed some parts but they had to wait for three months to get these parts because spain was locked after us and it finished after us and these parts are not there the, the technicians cannot travel you know it, it's all complications and yeah, yeah. the more international the more globalized you you were before, the more pain and problems you had, obviously. Um, well, uh, I'm just wondering if this will change or shift the minds of the uh, managers and the CEOs of the companies that they need to get, get back local, that the cost of deprived of the supplies uh, from abroad that were initially uh, cheaper would be uh, you would be substituted for the cost you need to pay obviously higher locally but you are not being uh, you know taken away from all your uh, supplies during such uh, lockdown which we i guess know that will be repeatable and yeah. the question if the ceos and ma managers will be able to 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 not to cut costs but to make greater costs in order to save money in the future I think it really depends on which kind of company you're talking about. So I think if you're talking about a small company that is by its, its own nature flexible, I think this can probably be done, although obviously they have a lot less means than a big company. But again, the small companies are probably not the ones who are outsourcing so much. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, the, the small design editors, in, in Italy we have a lot of design editors, people who sell lamps under their brand but in fact they are these lamps are made by local craftsmen or even even sometimes craftsmen in another country that are not chosen because they're cheap but because they are better at doing that sort of work program process i think they can probably change quite fast but if you're a big company and you have you know you have um how do you say stampy the molds you know to make parts i mean you know what investments it is to make a mold i mean you can't just say, I'm not going to go to the Chinese dude because he's yeah. in China and he can't deliver. And I, I don't think it's something that you can decide. I think in general, in the long term, people were already re revisiting what, you know, the, what globalization really was and what it was really bringing. 
um, in general because a little bit because the, the, the people want it, you know, more and more people are questioning the meaning of this, <coughs> which has a lot of good sides, globalization, lots of great sides, but lots of really bad ones as well. I think that you know, and the bad yeah. ones. Uh, I think uh, that uh, we will be able to uh, to think about the globalization within a year. Uh, from now, I guess, just to be able to to think how uh, how this whole pandemic influenced the way we live and the way we consume. And you mentioned that uh, many uh, companies actually uh, during the design congress you've mentioned said that they, their sales were getting higher compared to the last year. And I was wondering, is it because of uh, the online sales? Or is it because they, uh, you know, the offline stores opened and people went uh, buying uh, and yes. went to free? It, it, again, there are different scenarios. Um, well, first of all, of course, all the people, and this I know because I know quite well the companies that I'm talking about, although I, I don't want to mention the names. There are companies, I'm, and I'm talking about Italian companies, there are companies that have been always uh, betting on the digital presence, you know, always investing on creating a community, always investing on um, on being there, not just because you wanted to be there, but to use the web, the net creatively. So you don't use it just, to, you don't use, they don't even use it as e-commerce, but they use it to create uh, something like contact with people and also to get ideas from people. You know, these are companies that activate right. communities yeah. to create ideas and stuff. Those companies that are doing I mean, I heard the company is doing 40% more than it did the year before. And during the lockdown, of course, they didn't get orders, but they got orders for later. And I think, and a lot of companies yesterday were saying also some companies also do not have such a strong, uh, certainly not don't have e-commerce, because also these companies that I'm talking about didn't have e-commerce. Um, they're doing well because simply a lot of people had to live for so long in their homes. Imagine urban urban people, okay? I mean, I, I know a lot of people in Milan that actually, they've got beautiful houses and they spend one hour a day, you know, from midnight, you know, they arrive at midnight and they go to bed. They wake up in the morning, they get out for a cappuccino, have lunch outside, have dinner with friends, have a table, come home at 10. They never really use their home. So even you think about the targets of design, a lot of people are like this. And all these people, they had to spend two and a half months stuck in their homes. And then they saw, maybe this doesn't work so well. I mean, maybe this, you know, Apparently, a lot of people went to readjust families. You know, in think of families, maybe you have each one room, but then you need each one room in which you have to work and each one room in which your child has to do school. So yeah. you need to readjust the, the table and the, the setting. Or imagine if you have a small house. You know, everything has to be readjusted if you have to live in the house all the time, which I personally, I really hope we don't have to do because I hated it and I hate this. I hate this so much. No, you have no idea how much. So I actually don't like to even talk about it because I just want to hope that everything goes back to, you know, better than it was. Of course, we can improve things, but I really can't stand this living at home thing. Really, yeah. <laughs> Sorry um, for the design industry. Really, it's just not my thing. Yeah, refurbishing <laughs> and any uh, any hard work on uh, having your home design is is a tough uh, work. But then there is a good conclusion that uh, that the design industry can really earn its money after such breakdown. Uh, for all the industries actually but uh, also for the design industry the uh, the very uh, attractive and lively uh, experience were fairs festivals and conferences and obviously during the pandemic and also nowadays we cannot meet uh, we cannot see the new products being launched and being promoted and we actually cannot do the networking as it was uh, before the pandemic Few of the events have moved online. Few of them uh, decided not to um, organize the online events, but to postpone uh, to later, basically 2021. Um, what is your opinion? What kind of uh, industry events make sense nowadays in this new reality? And what formula should they have? Should they be online? Should they be offline? What do you think? Okay, I, I have a strong opinion about this because I, I, I thought when, when, the, when they said the salon was not going to happen, <coughs> excuse me, I hope I don't have the COVID, by the way. No. <laughs> uh, um, when, the, when they cancelled the salone, I thought immediately, if I was the salone, I would use this massive opportunity to, um, to create 
an online um, event that can be the memory of the future event, I explained. So I would have created an event for this year in which people could, in the platform, just show their things. Something that would have not been perfect, but would have been like a platform that then next year when they do do the Salone, they can have a, a real event, but they can also have an event for those who cannot attend. Because I, I believe that there will be a Salone next year, but it will not be like the way it used to be. You know, we're not gonna have the build, you know, you know the 500,000 people coming there because this is not going to end, unfortunately, very quickly or very smoothly. So there will be problems still next year, most probably. And even if there aren't, not many people maybe will want to travel yet. But if you do have something, and also, you know, imagine even if we can still travel. I mean, I used to go to the Salone all the time and see so much stuff. And then when I go home, if I want to remember everything, it takes me forever to go through the notes. It would be wonderful if I had a, a, something that can make me remember what I've seen online. Okay. Yeah. Or so I would have used this. Uh, yeah, I don't mean I don't. I didn't mean in the slightest to create a, a virtual event that replaces the real event because honestly, the virtual events is fun the first two times that you do them, but it's actually really quite boring. But the um, no, no, I don't mean. But you know, it's not, It would be much nicer if we were here, yeah. the two of us chatting, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, and the, the same with the salon. I don't think. Especially when you have to see furniture, it doesn't, you know, have to sit on a bed or on a sofa. What, what does it mean? You know, what does it mean to just see it? But then, but then you have to be ready that if this happens again, at least you've got something. Because this year the salon they didn't provide for anything. They did, you know, they created like a, a lot, they did something nice. You know, lots of editorial content online. It was lovely. You know, with all the designers talking, but nothing commercial. And I think if you want to keep the industry with you, you need to do something like that. And maybe they will, but they didn't do it this year. Um, so I do think that digital, everybody has understood now in Italy the power of what you can do with digital, which of course in other countries it was bloody obvious already for years. But in Italy, they've been always kind of skeptical. And now everybody's understood. And I think now is the moment to, to do something with this as an addition to the physical element. And then when the physical element is lacking for any reason, pandemic or whatever, then you can still have the digital or you can have both in a good situation. Right. No? One there, fits the other. Yeah, there is also uh, another question that popped into my mind uh, at the moment. You've been mentioning that you've been tired with the salon, uh, uh, so to say, road uh, to see new stuff. And this is also my observation that we've been flooded with new stuff that were actually new chairs, new tables, uh, new cupboards, new stuff that has already been invented that doesn't refer to any other, to any of our needs uh, that we have, that actually uh, makes, ma makes us feel more um, or less worth because we don't have new stuff and we need to have new stuff in order to be uh, fancy, sexy, and to be in the line with the, you know, with the uh, fancy people. And uh, I was just wondering if, uh, if we haven't gone too far with design being a marketing tool for upscaling sales, whether the design role should be to educate people, to, uh, to teach them that design is a powerful educational tool that may solve their problems, that it is a solution to problems they may have in the future, to, uh, that design can bring people um, together and make the world more accessible. I know that you know, those are big words, <laughs> but generally, oh, yeah, but this is the design's role. And within, I guess, five, last five years, I've seen the explosion of design like everywhere. If you put the design word in uh, every event, every meeting, every conference or every fair, it automatically put, uh, put sale and people would um, relate design with um, something beautiful and something aesthetical rather than functional and really needed. And uh, I wanted to ask you whether you, you think that we also, except for the fact that we should uh, see the advantage of online events, events that you said that you may search something online, have all um, kind of uh, put in order, that we also should change the way first magazines and media talk about design and promote design. Okay, there's a lot of topics here because yeah. uh, there's one topic about production. So yeah. uh, are we producing too much stuff uh, for the sake of it? 
yes, obviously. Just in the in the design industry, like in every industry, so it's not just a design issue of this. This yes. is an economic issue about consumerism. So it's, it would be wrong to say we have too many chairs, because although it's true, because we have also too many plates and too many um, dresses and too many hair clips. You know, we've got too much of everything, basically. Really, really, we do, and we don't need I'm like one fifth of this stuff. No, we don't need anything. Uh, saying that, um, design is another issue, though, because you said it's it's become like a fashionable word to add to things because it's become synonymous of aesthetic. And also, this has not been going on in the last five years. Obviously, it's been going on for many, many years because design has become, like you said, like a, a beautiful add-on that you put on top. I remember I used to work at Philips. My boss, Stefano Marzano, he fought for years because he was just trying to teach inside the company that design was not an add-on. So he didn't want designers to arrive at the end when the television was made, everything was made, and they just come over and they decide the color. He wanted the designers to work with the engineers when they were developing the technologies. Because the way you develop the technology, if you have a designer there, he will think about already about the usability, he will think about the user benefits, he will think about how to put that together with an environment that is a home environment. You know, it's a different kind of thinking. Yeah. So, of course, design is a much bigger value, and I'm so totally with you with that. Um, but on the other hand, yes, there is too much of everything, and design has been wrongly positioned, uh, especially by the media, and I'm part of the media, so I'm also part, you know, to blame in a way. But there's an explanation for that, and I can get to you later. Um, of course, when you start to say that design equals pretty, um, then you've lost completely what design is. You've lost completely the, the meaning. The meaning is that it's not form or function. To me, being Italian, uh, for us, design has always been um, the, the way you make things so that they accompany your, your anthropological gestures. Okay, So a good design is something that makes me... Um, other supports my my natural gestures and then make makes them easier more smooth, or it comes into a gesture that is not even existing yet and it helps me to, to do it. You know, Castiglione he designed things that didn't it, like um, you know this this chair with the saddle of the of yeah. the bike and, yeah. and it moves around and you think what the hell what what do you do with that? It's such a stupid thing. Well, he designed it because at that time they used to have phones on the wall. And then people used to have to stand and listen to the phone on the wall. And what he did is he designed something so that you could stand and still move around like you do when you're, you know, you stand yeah. from one leg to the other, but you would actually sit down. So it actually he accompanied like a new uh, lifestyle thing that was driven by something else, a telephone, with the design product. But now people who see it, they say, what the hell is that, you know? So it's, it's um, I think it's, uh, the, I think that is a very, uh, genial, uh, I'd say, a genius type of design because you you create something that doesn't exist. Of course, you cannot make another chair that doesn't exist because we've got so many chairs. But I also think not all, not all the chairs are, are good. You know, there's always room for another better chair. Although maybe we shouldn't make that many. I mean, the, the selection. I think there's a lack of selection in what we do always. Uh, I don't think we should stop designing. I think we should stop making so many. Of so many stuff, yeah. So many, you know. Yeah. It's just it's good to it's good to try things. I think you have to experiment with everything, but but then again, you need the money to do that, and then it's it's a it's a very long long discussion. But basically, the cheaper the cheaper you make things, the more you will make. So you make them cheap because you want to sell them in big numbers. So this is the the basis of of the you know the capitalistic economy that is wrong. Yeah, and, and you can't either we change that or we are stuck with that. Yeah, if you think that the more you produce, the less it's going to cost, it's like a circle. You're always going to have to produce more, otherwise you're you're not going to lose money. And yeah. this is consumer, you know, it's it's our economy, and I don't agree with that. I don't think it's good, but you know. I think we need good designers in the economy. I mean, not only politicians, but also good designers, people who would, you know rethink the process of how capitalism economy. Uh, should work and there are there are some good and nice uh, names in that already but I will leave, leave that to uh, to them and uh, I would like to ask you about the uh, online magazines because you've been running internet design journal uh, for the a month uh, and a half I yeah a month and a half yeah yeah and you've uh, you've moved from 
uh, posting each day to uh, to weekly uh, uh, weekly publishing, and I guess that publishing every day was a disaster. I mean, it was so it was an overload for for the content that should be of high quality and also for something that is uh, both. Um, pretty functional, interesting, and that you have uh, so many things to say and also are interesting for the people who are used to the printed version of the magazine. And how do you deal with that? How, uh, what is the most challenging part of running online magazine? And obviously, uh, yeah. This is, this uh, Intended Design Journal is a very strange online magazine because it's not like, um, okay, it's, it's got not, not much to do with the, the paper magazine, first yeah. of all, that it comes from. Um, it's a magazine. Online magazines normally they have a, a very big news uh, news approach. So they if something happens and they're online straight away. They tell the story. I hate that. I when they asked me to do something online for June, they asked me it was April. It was during the lockdown, and uh, and I said I want to do something that talks about people that are people care about. You know, these are the words that we use as topics. Yeah. Um, so we talk about things that apparently have got nothing to do with design. So we talked about love, uh, nostalgia, uh, social media, um, uh, openness today, I don't remember all of them. Uh, we, we will talk about water, we will talk about uh, flexi you know, uh, fragility, all sorts of things. And then we will show that design can matter when you talk about that. So that was, that's, my, that's what I wanted to do with this magazine. I wanted to, people to read, to read it and to say, Oh, I didn't know that design design could be interesting also when you talk about this, okay? Because you don't expect it. You don't expect that uh, uh, some some of them were quite obvious. You know, we talked about cities, uh, but we never we never once said today we talk about tables or whatever. Yeah, uh, we, 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 when you talk about love, or exactly, you know, we talked about love, and you say, what does love have to do with design? But it, it does obviously, and because because my my message is everything. Is a project. Everything you can live your life as a nice project if you know how to design it. And uh, and and I think that's um, that that's really has always been my approach to design. That design is imbued in everything we do. Um, even people who are not designers, obviously, they have to have the possibility to make life as a project. And so I wanted to give people the idea that design is not a distant thing of people who make luxury stuff. People who have too much money that sense. But designers can actually make something, make you think about the way you live your daily life and make you know, it better. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but it always uh, makes me wonder, is it that we as people who are interested in design believe that this is interesting or if it is really interesting for people who may just find it somewhere and, you know, uh, sort of get lost in, uh, in the topic and find that the design is really interesting, if, if you know what I mean. because. Uh, Sometimes I I, um, I get the feeling that uh, it's with all industries actually that we are so excited about what we uh, what we do, and we only uh, go through the people that are interested in the same topic. Whereas sometimes it is interesting to find people who are not interested in our topic and make them wonder if they can. This is the most interesting bit because exactly the design journal was born like this. So in every issue, I have a, a, an opinion that is expressed by somebody. Okay, in my original project, they were all going to be external people, like people who have got nothing to do with design. Yeah. Then you know I'm inside the big publisher, and it's you know sometimes you need to compromise on some things. So we need you know in the end we had a lot of uh, we had a lot of architects and designers writing, but they always write about something that is not their work. Um, and they give opinion on something which they are specialized in, in which they know. Um, but I, to me, my dream, my dream would be obviously to make a magazine about design that doesn't talk about design as necessarily, but it, but it, but the designers would like to read because I, I know designers very well, and they don't want to read about design. In my opinion, they want to read about stuff that that can help them to design things broaden, better. Broaden their yeah. Path. Ah, because yeah. they're clever people, they're clever people. I don't think they want to read about how another is, unless unless you propose to them. I think another good magazine would be also to talk uh, very much in detail, like Domus used to do many many years ago, about how an object is designed from a very technical, technical perspective. Yeah. 
but I think probably it would be like an audience of 10 people uh, reading it, but I know who these 10 people are and they've asked me once, why don't you do that? Yeah, well, you can, you can call, call a friend and <laughs> it has the specialist or watching YouTube tutorial. But uh, uh, what is the most difficult uh, stuff for you uh, while running online magazine? How is it different? You've been running your own blog since 2011 and uh, oh, now... So much easier. It's, it's so much easier because I did it all. I did it all by myself when I wanted and when I felt like it. But one, okay, one thing in common between my blog and this one is that it comes from the same vision, like this idea that I told you that designer, my blog has been born for that. So, and I've never followed the news. So I really don't care about what's going on. I really don't care that somebody has made a new, a new something. And I read about it and then I keep it in my mind. And then if I find a topic in which I can fit that in, then it's nice, you know, but I don't want to just make a news because somebody has made something new. Yeah. So I like articles that mix things together, that make people think, you know, and I like thinking myself. But the difficulty about running a magazine is that it's, okay, the question should be, why is it so difficult to run a magazine from a big publisher? Because that's the whole issue. When you're on your own and you run your own online magazine, you can do what you want. Okay, you can call the people that you want, you can organize the way that you want, uh, um, people will work, you know, you can choose everybody that works with you, um, which was quite the case this time, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier, let's say, there's, there's no calls of endless talks about budgets and political, you know, it's, it's very no, much... it's always yeah. the same, there's no difference whether you make it online or offline, it's always about working with other people. <laughs> and it's always about working with other people, yeah. I mean, I've never been uh, doing the job that I'm doing now for a printed magazine. For a printed magazine, I was in the editorial staff, so I, I never had to, like, say, think about all the content. Uh, I just had to make proposals, and, um, and I think it's exactly the same. I think on printing, it's probably harder because it's, you know, the, the mistakes that you make, you, you have to do them much more in advance, so it's, it's harder, yeah. I think, on paper. Um, and I love to do a paper, obviously. I think doing a magazine on paper is so much nicer. In general, I like paper magazines. Paper. Do you think there's a, there's a future for the paper magazines? Design, oh, paper so. design magazine? Oh, I did, by design, I think, yes, if it's not a useless magazine. I think if it's, if it's another one that shows beautiful homes. But then again, you're asking the wrong person because maybe I'm not a very good marketer. I, I really, I, I don't like reading about beautiful homes. Okay. And I know it seems paradoxical because I work in this. I just find them so incredibly boring. You know, like uh, they're all the same, especially because I've been writing this text for years and years. All these people who will find these beautiful things in the little market in Paris, and then they, you know, all have the same stories. Um, so I don't like, I, I think we don't need that. But then again, I'm probably wrong because I know that even online magazines who talk about this have huge numbers, huge numbers. So, you know, you're asking the wrong person. I think, I think I would prefer to do a magazine that is read by 5,000 people in the whole world, but then they read it and they think it's useful rather than doing something that is made for huge amounts of people. I mean, I don't want to change the world, you know, I just want to talk about things that I enjoy and make people who read them happy to read them, that's all. Yeah, so maybe maybe the solution for such such magazine is to make those 5,000 people pay for all the stuff that is needed for this online magazine or printed magazine to uh, to be created. You know, like the, it's not being sponsored by the company, so you don't pay any paid by uh, tax. You just have people that will pay a certain amount of money, like for housing. People want to have their own houses uh, designed in a way they want and in place they want. So they just, you know, put forward some amount of money and have one person that's doing those. So maybe that's the, the option for the online magazine with the... Well, the money is always a problem because, you know, earlier we were talking about why magazine, you know, um, I mean, you need to pay people who work, um, you know, on a magazine. You know, we don't work for free, even if we're journalists, and it sounds really cool. Yeah. We need to earn money, and um, and basically to write an article. If it's a good article, you know, it takes time. It doesn't. You know, if you want to write a shitty article, then of course you can do yeah. it, and they give you twenty euros, and you're happy because you've done it in ten minutes. But you know, a good article is not ten minutes, and it's not half a day. It's maybe two days, and then you know, in two days you need to earn some money. And so you need somebody to pay for the magazine. So if you calculate how many articles there are in the magazine and how many people have to work to, to lay it out, to find the pictures, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, it comes out that it costs quite a lot. Yeah. And then 
you know, even if, you know, if, if people want to just read it online and not pay, then you've got a problem. So you need to have sponsors. So you need to talk about the stuff that the sponsors pay for. It's just very simple. If people were paying for the magazines, then, as I say, I used to work at La Repubblica. You know, people complain about the quality of the online of La Repubblica, and I understand my colleagues. They have to work, you know, they have to put up stuff, you know, there are 10 people writing 3 million things to save money and because nobody wants to pay. I yeah. mean, now it's a, there's a paywall now, but, you know. Yeah, everybody wants the free stuff, yeah, and now and of good, good quality. And this is the risk of being uh, not consumers, but prosumers. I mean, people that can comment on the work that's being delivered, that we are in the social media, that you can instantly comment, demand, and uh, you are uh, sort of in a position uh, that you are not thankful for what you are paying, but you demand because you have paid. And yeah. actually, you don't want to pay because you've been uh, screened a commercial or you, or you have seen a commercial and this is something that is, you know, for free and should be for, for free. With this, I would like to uh, ask you, do you think that online events and marketing will ever replace the offline ones? Replace, replace? No. Replace, replace, yeah. No, no. Also because I see uh, young people, like my kids, um, Okay, my, my daughter, actually, she does say to me, I, I would never buy a paper magazine. She does say that. And she, I don't think she's ever bought a paper magazine. Apart from once, there was a guy that did some rapper that she liked and she bought it because of that. Um, but, then, but then again, when, for example, in books, she really likes to read books. And all of her friends, they like to read books in paper. So I, 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 I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't think they would disappear. I mean, I think uh, I can see also that advertising on paper magazines is still there. It's less than before and it's cheaper than before, but it's still coming in because I think at the end of the day, I think what I really miss online and what I really don't like of online is that you don't have a memory, which is the reason why I made the design journal, which seems an absurd. I, I made the design journal a daily paper or a weekly paper so that if you press the button on that day, then you can, remember, you can see all that was published on that day. And I like that because that's like on a, like on a newspaper. And you know what, what we know when you say what happened two years ago. You can take out a lot of public from two years ago, and you read and you see, and you have a feeling, a feeling yeah. of a memory of life. But now, if you look it up online, you find the information immediately, but you don't put it in a context. And I, I, to me, that is irreplaceable. Really, I prefer to have a, you know a whole collection of magazines like you have that all the books that you have yeah. there at the back. Uh, you know, but of course I'm old, you know, I'm 50, so I'm a different, you know, maybe people who are 30 think differently. I don't, I don't buy, you know, I read books on the Kindle, so it's not like I'm not fixed, but I prefer to have a paper book, but I also read on the Kindle. I think it's a mixture, you know. I wouldn't spend my money to buy a magazine that means nothing, but I would spend my money for a magazine that is nice, that I can read afterwards. I mean, I always buy Internationale, which to me is the best magazine in the world which is a magazine that collects the best articles from international press yeah. every week on a topic. And there's a very, very strong curatorial aspect to this. So the editor, to me, is a genius. He, he collects, he has a theme, he writes an editorial about this theme, and then he collects stuff from all over the world, writes it in Italian. So this is, lovely. this is lovely because it gives you, as I said, a context then you are not a narrow-minded person that has only one view, which is done by algorithms, actually, nowadays, when you yeah. open up uh, Instagram or uh, Facebook or some other social media or even a, a, a website, then you have only the context of people that are similar to you. you I, think pe I think people, people want curatorship now. I, I, believe, I believe that my job as a journalist now is to curate what comes, okay? Because I have to select things uh, for people. And I know I know it's partial because you can say, she is a woman, she's got this political idea, she's got, so she selects this for me. Yes, I do, that's fine. If I was a different person, I would select something else. But that's great because I like to read, I like people who stand for something, you know? If I, if I stood for something else, I would show you, I would talk to you about something else. But yeah. that's life. I, I, just, uh, I, um, uh, I just thought that, uh, the, the, the question popped, uh, if you should be curated, if you are a curator, in such a way that it, uh, somehow you may find only one path of uh, things you choose as a journalist, 
and maybe like psychologists they have you know a, a person that they can uh, talk to just in order to have their minds and their path reconstructed to start thinking differently and I was just wondering whether you as a journalist who is a curator might have your own curator that makes you sometimes think out of the box, out of the pattern that you have chosen for some time. Yeah, I would like that. I would love to have somebody like that. And uh, um, I am a very flexible person, actually. I know everybody wants to be. Um, no, no, I think I'm, I'm very fixed on some things, and I'm, but I'm very flexible about the content within those yeah. things. So um, if somebody uh, says to me, that I'm wrong about something or somebody has a great idea about something else, I'm totally running with it. I don't have any issues about ownership or about not sharing. Or I mean, for me, that's like total nonsense. Unfortunately, I know in Italy, this is a very big issue. I mean, I, I grew up professionally in Holland, where I think people are really very much like this. Um, you know, they, if they're wrong, they say, all right, no problem, we'll do it again. You know, in, in Italy, sometimes it's very difficult to admit that people are wrong or or they get offended if you, you know, it's, it's a bit of a different culture, you need to manage it better. Um, so yes, I would love to have like a, somebody who, you, your question is basically, would I, would I like to have somebody curating me? Yeah, into, yeah. yeah I would love that. I, I, I am surrounded by nice, by intelligent people, so I'm happy to, uh, I, yeah. Great. I think, I think that this, is, this is also the bad thing about COVID, you know, because um, you know, when I came to your event, uh, Element Talks, you know, I met loads of really, really interesting people. And of course, you go home and you've got your life fueled up because you've got, you know, you met this guy here, the, the woman there, and everybody had like some great points of view, which actually have never left me. You know, like I'm still thinking about this this former Katya that I met that she was doing some training about people to, to take out their creativity during the lab, the, the yeah. workshops. And I keep thinking, how can I connect what she does with what I do to make something? You know, like it's it's being with people that that makes you that challenges what you know and what you want to do. That that's so. That's also the the, the perfect answer to the question whether the online uh, events will ever be uh, replaced by the offline <coughs> ones. It will never happen. We will need to always meet offline just to feel the energy, just to just to feel each other and take from each other. We need the physical side mainly because it allows for the mistakes. You know, it allows when you're when you're online like this. Uh, maybe we will get more used to it, but it, it really always feels like you're you're broadcasting, which you are. Yeah. So there's kind of there's a kind of lack of spontaneity in this. Uh, I remember when I was doing virtual aperitivo with my friends. You know, at the beginning and. It just felt, it just felt empty, you know. It was fun, you know. It was fun, we were drinking and laughing, but but it wasn't, you know. It it, it, it doesn't allow for the pauses. Because I mean, if, I, if we didn't have anything to say here, we're online. We would just say, okay, we'll see you another time. And stop the call. Yeah. Exactly. If you're in my room and, I, and we've got nothing to say for five minutes, we're quiet for five minutes, and then maybe we start again. It's a very different idea, you know. It's I think that's why. Um, I think physical, of course, I mean, we're physical people, but I think that online will have a more of a more importance. We need to put it in the right frame. You know, it's important that it's there uh, as a memory and uh, as a support to what's physical, but not as a replacement. And also as a, as a help to make people connect even more. Because, you know, you can connect much more. I mean, now I'm doing a lot of video interviews with people that are really far away from me. And I just do them with my phone. And then the, all the, the two videos are put together. I, I feel myself, the other person films her or himself, and then we have them put together, and, and something nice comes up. And I could have never done it before without this. Yeah, I've, I've seen the one with Piero Lissoni, and it was really ah. nice. Yeah. Sorry, the problem is that the translation, we don't, have, we don't really manage to do the subtitles. Yeah, but, yeah. The, but, but the Italian, I, I, was, uh, I was learning Latin for five years, so it's kind of. Oh. I think yeah. it's very, yeah. He's so funny. I know he seems really rigid, but he was so funny because he also said some really, really crazy things which we cut out, but because it was kind of insult insulting this people. Is they <laughs> <didn't sound nice. laughs> this is so much fun in working as a journalist, I believe, that when you are talking with people, you sometimes get the, the occasion to get some funny stuff out of people that you would never have thought they were funny. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, no, I knew he was funny because I, I spoke to him before many times and I know he's a funny guy, but. Um, yeah, yeah, I know he doesn't seem to be, but he's, 
Many things have changed, and you are also a business consultant. And uh, do you see any changes in uh, in your clients' demands with what they come up to you at the moment? Uh, does it change any anyhow to what they have come up with to you for this year before the COVID? Okay, well, this is tricky because I only started working as a um, um, because you know until last year I was at the, at the newspaper, I was at La Repubblica. So I only started in January this year, really, with this new business. And luckily, I got a lot of customers, which was nice. Well, a lot, you know, some. And uh, so it's difficult for me to say before or after. Yeah. <laughs> so it was all during. Um, but what I've noticed um, is that there's two attitudes like this. Okay, but one one uh, company that I work for is super advanced in digital, like super, super. And, um, and they just even pushed harder. So they were like... Uh, really um, they have a like a little team of which I'm part um, just to do brainstorming every week or two about what's coming up. So we brainstormed about all sorts of things that went from product development to how we should communicate. We know what we should should we put on Facebook in the phase two when it's gonna come or when are we gonna you know all these sort of things from the most detailed to the most uh, and just as chats. So I think that's a very, very clever way of doing it from companies that I don't know many who do, who do that. And then there's other people who... And they are spend, paying you just for chatting? Yeah, me and other people, yeah. Very nice, right. very but, nice. <laughs> yeah, but it, the chats are not chats, you know, like... Um, um, yeah, well, they, wa they want us basically to provide provide ideas, like big antennas, you know, provide ideas about uh, information about what's going on that we, we think could be relevant and try to translate that into something that could be relevant for the company. Yeah. Um, so, of course, I think that's a big help for a company because, like you talked about multicultural, the people who are in this team, they're multi, you know, multi. Uh, yeah. I mean, our journalist, there's a, an architect, there's, a, there's, a, there's another person that's something, you know. Like it's different views, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. Uh, I, I, don't, I think I think most companies, from lots of PR friends, uh, women who are in PR uh, friends of mine, I think most people are trying now to invest a lot on communicating and and trying to be there because uh, because they need to. First of all, a lot of people save a lot of money by not doing the salone, obviously, so they have budgets. Um, I expect that if we will have problems in the journalism and communications or whatever, it will be in six months. I think that's when we will really know if people have been, companies have been able to withstand the, right. the hit. Yeah. If those two months of stop have only been two months, uh, if the shops, you know, if you sell only to America and America, I know now America is still blocked for yeah. furniture companies. That, that's a really big problem. Um, you know, if you if you say if you only sell to America, eighty percent of what you do, you you bugger. You know, what are you going to do? Um, so it depends on the companies, and we don't know. Uh, we don't know, really. Yeah. This is. Uh, do, do you have any um, travel companies at your consultancy? Travel. Travel. No. Yeah, tourists. No. No, but I'm for, but, I'm, but my sister's husband. What do you want to know? What's going on in the travel? Yeah. <laughs> because of my sister's husband, he works for. Um, uh, they live in Singapore, and he works for this company that has this massive, uh, beautiful um, uh, boats, like wooden things or whatever. They cost uh, huge amounts of money to go on a cruise. Like it's, it's a kind of adventure cruise, but in a, in a very luxurious environment. And the customers are mainly hugely rich Americans. We're talking people who pay like 10,000 euros per person for a week. Um, and they go on the Mekong River and on the Rio de la Amazonia in, uh, in Brazil and in Peru or whatever. And completely, like, everything stops, everything. Yeah. So they haven't, done, they haven't earned a penny since... Uh, uh, February, and now they chopped all the wages of all the people working there. They sacked everybody they could sack. They, my sister's husband, in fifty percent now, and you know it's a problem. Yeah, I think I, I, know, know, uh, problem. I guess also the, the tourism companies also related with design, the uh, interior design. The you know uh, it's ev everywhere it's related, and I, I was wondering whether design can be responsible. I mean, can you uh, can you be a designer that is responsible for the effects of your work, meaning that you are not only designing the chair, 
but also design a service or a solution for a person that went back bankrupt because of the COVID. And that you are, uh, as a designer, that you are designing a solution for that person. I think, I think a, design, a designer can do this, a service designer could certainly mm -hmm. think, of a serv think of a way in which to face a lot of problems, many problems, from political to financial, like you say. Um, but I think not every designer can do this. I think service designers can do this. You know, designers who have been trained into doing something more than designing products. Yeah. Or something different, something different, but not more, something different. Uh, so I think you know if you're if you're a designer who makes uh, furniture or, or or telephones or whatever, I think for you it's gonna not, not be. I mean, the, the, you should probably have the, the right mentality into uh, facing problems and uh, analyzing problems and trying to find solution that is the correct one. But I think doing service design um, is a bit of a different um, set of skills. Like you, you need something more than just that, you know. To, yeah. to, um, uh, so I think a lot. Of, I think a, a, some technology would be good as well. You know, I think you can do a lot with algorithms if you were not knew how to design them properly. I yeah. think algorithm design is like a massive thing that could be of help. You know, in, into solving a lot of issues together with service design. So, uh, what's in store for the design industry within the next six months or a year? Algorithms? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I don't know. I wish I knew. I don't know. I think in six months we should evaluate again what happened. If if things stay the way they are now, which is not normal but not so bad, you know, like yeah. if it carries on like this, I think in six months we can say we can say we are saved or we're not. If in six months the lockdown starts again, then I think we're gonna have a massive issue. I mean, if the salon doesn't happen next year, we're gonna have a massive issue in the land, like massive. And I think a lot of companies. Not so much the furniture company, the companies that work around them, you know, the people yeah, who Yeah, yeah, the business, of course. It's, it's, sure it's, a mass. Yeah, it's a massive, yeah. You know, the, 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 the houses, uh, the, the hotels, everything. I mean, it's really massive for our, for our economy. So I think in six months that we can evaluate. And also the education, you know, it's, it's difficult. I mean, will people really go to university now? Uh, know. Probably yeah. they will, but, but, you know, I hope so. But it's, it's different, you know, are you really learning the same... Uh, you know, probably the different type of students would be also obvious. You know, some people will probably learn better like this, and some people will learn worse. It's, it's, yeah, it really depends. It's, it's, uh, it's a huge challenge, but also, as you said, you can combine, as uh, you suggested about the Salone International Milano, that you can have them offline and online. The same with education. You may uh, do the lectures or the lessons offline, but also you can supplement it with the online extras for people yeah. who feel better doing that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's been fantastic talking to you, Laura, for this uh, almost an hour. Uh, the, the last, yeah, <laughs> um, I, have, I have a question. What is your inspiration? What inspires you as a journalist, as a person that deals with uh, design? Because we, we've mentioned, this is the question, we've mentioned that designers not necessarily want to uh, read about design. They don't necessarily want to dwell into the, um, the things that they are doing. And you as a journalist that deals with design, you need to have something that inspires you, that makes you feel and think broader, wider, look for inspiration. So if you would choose one book, one magazine, and one movie or a TV series that inspires you. Oh, that's you. really, that's really not very. No, that's really hard for me. That's really so, hard for me. Whatever. Because, uh, because, uh, because, um, um, what I, what I tend to do when I want to find inspiration, well, no, inspiration is the wrong. Uh, you know, when I want to find something that I want to talk about, I try to think, what, what am I worried about now, or what am I obsessed yes. with now as a person. And then normally it comes up that it's something related to something that's going on or something that is not going on or something very deeply personal. And I think in the end, it, it's something very universal, you know, because we all, you know, uh, love and hate and are worried. And so we all, um, I, I, you know, and then when, when I have the topic, I think, oh, maybe now, now I'm worried. Like last year, for example, I remember two years ago, I was obsessed with data, data collection, yeah. because I had gone to this conference and I spoke to this guy, uh, Elgeny Morozov, and he told me this thing about data collection, and I was so obsessed. I wrote about data collection for like months, 
And then, you know, that was what it was. And then I found out that lots of people were thinking about it. So, but it just came from me, you know, it just came from listening to this person talking. So sometimes it can, I, I, let's say I like to look at everything with an open mind, but, and, and try to find what triggers me emotionally and rationally in whatever I see. So, you know, when I walk in the streets, it's like, you know, what, what catches your attention and why? What, what do you find? You know, it's that sort of, a, I think it's a very designer attitude, what I have, although I'm not a designer. Because every time I ask designers, you know, how do you come to this solution? They all, they all say something very similar, you know, that they actually, they don't read the magazine or a book. They, you know, now I'm reading They're a book not there. and nothing. I'm reading a book called the English Passengers, which I read many, many years ago already twice, and I'm reading it for the third time. And it's about Tasmania. And it's a, to me, it's an amazing book, the way it's written by Matthew Neal. But, you know, it's got nothing to do with design or nothing to do with... But uh, this, is what, uh, this is actually what you said before, that designers and creative people, they don't necessarily look for inspiration or just for comfort of the, their minds in design-related uh, magazines or books or stuff like this. This is something what you do by making what you do, actually, like courage. You, can, you cannot learn how to be courageous until you are. Yeah, can I say to one, one thing? I think one thing that's really useful is to talk to people who are not from your environment, but also, uh, I know I'm saying a bad word, but also uh, from a social perspective. You know, I, I like to talk to people who have different jobs and not good jobs, um, uh, people who have, have it hard to make a living, maybe, or, you know, whatever, because I really like to understand also because, uh, you know, luckily for me, I'm, I'm in, a, in an okay situation. Um, I'd like to understand also issues, yeah, you know, that right. we yeah. think, yeah, because we take for granted a lot of things, you know, like, uh, I mean, uh, all the issues about kids I know because I've had kids, you know, so all the, all the things, try to see other people's perspective, and that's nice to listen to other people, that's, that's nice. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Laura. I will now just uh, say goodbye to our audience and thank them for uh, being with us. And um, Thank you. Thank you. Dziękujemy Wam bardzo za to, że byliście z nami przez ostatnią godzinę. Jeśli macie jeszcze jakieś pytania do nas, śmiało je zadawajcie. Ja postaram się zapytać Laurę po naszym spotkaniu i jeśli chcecie jakąś odpowiedź, przesłać ją Wam mailowo, czy też na naszych mediach społecznościowych. Pamiętajcie o naszych kolejnych spotkaniach z i do zobaczenia. Dziękuję. Dziękuję.